Okay, good afternoon, Richard. Good afternoon, Eileen, and good afternoon, Ari. Good, good afternoon, afternoon, everybody. Our we have audience from all across Indonesia, and we thank first of all to our distinguished speakers, Bu Ari, Richard, and Eileen, for your time to attend our uh, our celebration of World Heritage Day hosted by Indonesian Heritage Trust. And uh, this World Heritage Day Forum would discuss the new paradigm shift in conservation under the title Complex Past, Diverse Futures. And uh, we have uh, three distinguished speakers to share with us their, their insights and the experiences, the knowledge. We, our audience consists of, I think, many academicians, practitioners, architects, activists, and so we are happy to have them here to join us and uh, to enrich our discussion. And uh, as usual, I would like to introduce our speakers, but I would not be long. As we know that uh, we can ask Mr. Google if we want to know more about our distinguished speakers. But as a, as a courtesy, I would like to, to briefly introduce all, each of them. Most of us know already Dr. Richard Engel, Engelhardt is a former UNESCO Regional Advisor for Culture in Asia and Pacific. And he has been practicing, advising, supervising heritage projects and in heritage research also for the past 30 years. And he now is based in, uh, in Bangkok. Chiang Mai. Yeah, sorry, in Chiang Mai. Sorry, Richard, he's in Chiang Mai. And uh, he has, he has his, he, he was educated in anthropology, archeology span and history of East, South and Southeast Asia in Harvard and Yale. And we have also our, our colleague from England, Dr. Eileen Orbasley. She is an independent consultant with over 15 years of experiences in UK and in international projects. She is a practicing architect and specialized in conservation of buildings and heritage management. She has past experiences as project coordinator, research fellow, site architect for restoration, and also she, she has involved in the restoration of the Trajan Temple Pergamon in Turkey, one of the most distinguished projects in archaeology from 89 to 93. And she's also a member of ICOMOS in UK. She served as ex board of member and in many positions in the training committee. And from Indonesia, we are so proud to be represented by Ibu Ari, Ibu Chatrini, or we all know her as Ibu Ari. She is the chairman of Indonesian Heritage Trust. And she's also a member of ICOMOS Indonesia. She has wide experiences in both academic and practices in heritage conservation. And currently, she's also the director executive of the Arsari Joyo Hadikusumo Foundation. And she is now pursuing her PhD in ITB. And she has been <clears throat> so instrumental in the last decades, in the last few decades of Indonesian heritage movement. And so, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you. Richard, Buari, and uh, Eileen. As we know, the, uh, the, there is a current shift from uh, old approach in conservation, which is mostly based on buildings and looking at the city as uh, the historic city as a group of old building or heritage buildings. Moving from that to the current discourse to how to see historic monuments and historic towns as also 
something that should be defined, should be enriched with the, with, with, with the people who live or who work in that site or in that city, which we can describe as more to the value-based approach and the value would be mostly should be described or should be attributed by uh, the community, by the people. And uh, before we we move on to our our talks, we have the uh, the honor to enjoy Richard's presentation as a as introduction to today's topic. Please, Richard, or the co-host could help uh, Richard to show his presentation. Thank you. I think I can just share my screen. You All right, great. Time is yours, Richard. I don't know if I just... Now I just need to get to the whole presentation. How do I do that? My problem is that I need to move to presentation mode. Yeah, you should. Bottom left-hand corner, Richard. Yeah, but I can't get to the bottom left-hand corner. It's ah. not on my screen. Okay, there, there, there. I think I'm going to be able to move my screen now. Nope. Not enough. Maybe by doing this, moving it up there. Now I'll be able to. There, this should right. do it, right? Yes, yes, it's clear. Okay, very good. Huh? Yeah. Now I'm just going to make a very, very brief introduction to this idea of uh, changing paradigm, uh, a paradigm shift, or a changing strategy toward heritage. Uh, conservation and what it means in terms of uh, sustainable development. Uh, many of you will have heard this before, so I'll be very, very brief. It's just the backgrounder to our discussion. Uh, and I want to start off by saying that sometimes when we hear this idea about changing strategy, we hear it talked about as being something Western approach versus Eastern approach or Europe versus Asia. And sometimes we hear it talked about being tangible versus intangible. Uh, but I don't think either of those are the right way to actually think about it. I think we are actually embedded in kind of a, a, a global movement that is moving uh, away from, I would say, the, the idea of, of uh, heritage as a kind of elitist, rich person's tool uh, or a commodity for consumption by people who have a, the money to, to consume to a populist tool that can be utilized for sustainable development. And that's in fact what we mean when we talk about this, this idea called a global strategy, which in fact the World Heritage Committee adopted officially in 1994 and has been pushing ever since. Now, the reason they, they did this uh, has to do with this idea of, of a, a previous monumental based approach. And by looking at the sites that were inscribed on the World Heritage List and those sites that consume most of our resources in conservation and those sites that tourists go to visit, um, what we find is that the, uh, not only are, it, are those sites mostly monuments, religious properties, or uh, uh, archeological sites or, or sites from ancient civilizations. In fact, the ones that, pe the ones that countries are planning to put on the list are also in the same category. So we have a, a problem of more of the same. Huh? And uh, if we want to use heritage as a way to promote the diversity of the world's culture, 
and therefore using heritage as a resource for the development of communities everywhere, we have to democratize this approach. And in fact, when we look at the World Heritage List, we see what I say is lots and lots of palaces of rich and powerful people on the list. We see lots and lots of temples and churches and mosques of, again, rich and powerful priests on the list. And we see lots and lots of forts and, and uh, massive building structures of the military generals and the power brokers of, on the list. So indeed, if we talk about whose heritage have we been preserving, we can say it's the heritage of the princes, the priests, and the politicians of this world. Now, there's, there's something a little bit strange about this, uh, first of all. Uh, not only most of us are not princes, priests, or politicians, and so therefore we can easily ask the question, where is our heritage? But also it's quite clear that uh, governments are uh, quite a able to protect this heritage and quite willing to find the resources to invest in it. And so the real issues of conservation are not around these kinds of resources. The real issues are around the more vulnerable kinds of resources, but not less important. And they start way back in time with the kinds of archeological sites that maybe not are sexy because they're not the famous civilizations of the past, but they are the sites that, that begin to make us understand how humans have spread all over the world. So early prehistoric sites. And then we find that as humans spread all over the world, uh, they uh, connected in different uh, places of, of commerce. And that gave rise to most of the cities that we inhabit today and those cities that we like to visit. And, and the backbone to that, uh, are all of our agricultural landscapes. Most of the world, most of the humans who have lived in this world for the past uh, at least uh, 10,000 years have been farmers. And so if we're talking about the heritage of humanity, we have to be talking about the heritage of farmers or we're not talking about uh, the heritage of, of the greater part of humanity. And the Likewise, we can make the same observation about the traders and the businessmen and the shopkeepers and all of those people who don't have names in history, but who have in fact kept the world moving uh, through, their, through the commerce and the trade and the linkages they have made from one culture to another. Even less sung are the workers the people who worked in the factories, the faceless workers, maybe they only had first names and they were certainly underpaid and they had short lives, uh, but nonetheless, our world would not be and not look like it is. Uh, and we cannot understand it or its present form and its uh, future problems if it were not for the workers who shape the industry, the industrial heritage of the world. We also have an enormous uh, heritage of uh, students uh, who have studied all of these things and contributed to the innovation of new ideas. So we can say the, head, the heritage of students. And in fact, what are we talking about? We're really talking about heritage of everyday life. Now that heritage is not very well protected. And so our real issue in heritage conservation is how do we safeguard this heritage of the people? Safeguarding and conserving the heritage of princes, priests, and politicians is a no-brainer. Everybody's got plenty of money for it and tourists visit it. And it's, it's actually, uh, if we don't do a good job of that, it's just because we're bad managers. But what about her the heritage of everybody else, of all the people? And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, a, a paradigm shift, how to recognize this heritage, how to, how to understand how to safeguard it, how to resource this conservation, and how to activate it 
as a part of, of uh, sustainable development. So if we're talking about a heritage approach, what I like to say is this is what kind of thing we're embedded in. The old approach was really about monuments, yes. And now we're talking about the additional importance of places and spaces of ordinary people. The old approach, yes, was about abandoned relic archeological sites, but now we're talking about sites that continue to grow and to change and to uh, transmit the cultural identity of the community. Before we focused on physical components, but with continuing and living sites, we are talking about living traditions and continuing practices and intangible heritage that needs to be continued. Before we talked about management by central administration, it was relatively easy to do. We had very few sites. Uh, we had government funds. It was there a few people and a few offices to take care of the site. Now, if we're talking about looking at all of these different kinds of sites, uh, agricultural landscape, uh, industrial heritage, uh, towns and shops and houses, we actually cannot do this by central administration alone. We have to decentralize our management. And probably most important is that previously heritage was looked upon as kind of a, an elite resource used by rich people for their amusement, their recreation, their enjoyment. That's because, in fact, that's what it was. It was the monuments of the princes, priests, and politicians, the rich people of the past. But now, if we're talking about heritage of everybody, we're talking about a much different kind of utilization of that heritage. And this is for development. We can be talking about heritage no longer being something dead, but as something living. No longer is heritage something to be put behind the bars uh, and separated from the community, but integrated into all of the different parts of the community and all the different problems that that means. And the, the bottom line of this is that now we are talking about heritage as an integral part of achieving sustainable development, not as something that is contrasted with development. We're not choosing between heritage conservation and development. We are instead having integrating these by looking at the experiences and the investments, the successes and failures of the past and how those investments and those experiences can inform us toward better and better and more sustainable uh, future development choices. This is the heritage concept, uh, heritage paradigm we're embedded in. It's, it's not a paradigm about materials. It's not a paradigm about earth, east, east versus west. It's not a paradigm about tangible versus intangible. It's a paradigm about uh, elitist uh, commodities or tools and resources and assets for, for global development. So that is actually my introductory, uh, short introductory uh, presentation. And I hope that that will then stimulate our conversation as we move forward. Hi. All right, thank you, Richard. It's a very enlightening uh, presentation. And uh, it has, it has signed it has shown the light to our today's uh, topic. And I hope this would trigger and stimulate our participants later on to, to raise some questions. But before we move to the, uh, to the opportunity for the, for the audience, I would like to, uh, I would like to address some questions to our speakers, our resource persons and, but, First of all, I've, I would like once again to welcome all our, our friends, our colleagues. There are 34, 35 people now joining us, I think not only from Indonesia, but from some other parts of the world. And I wish all of you happy Heritage, World Heritage Day 2021. And we have been so grateful to Richard's uh, introduction 
And from your presentation, Richard, we we understand that uh, in all those uh, heritage uh, 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 objects or monuments or or, or nowadays uh, also communities of historic towns, they have been a, a destination of itself for tourists. And everywhere in the world, in every conference, in every seminars nowadays, we are all are facing these uh, questions about how to reconcile the, the, the mass tourism, the impact of tourism to, to the, to the sustainability of the monuments of the communities. And this shift, of course, in some ways or the other, have, have, have put their value, the, 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 the value uh, owned by the community in, in, in risk. And how do you, how do you think that uh, this should be, how should be handled with? And as we know, because not only the local has the, let's say, uh, uh, previously the local has their 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 uh, authority or it is their domain to 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 define their their own heritage through their their own traditional values. But now visitors seem to come in the way. And how to reconcile this uh, challenge, Richard? Do you want to ask me or do you want to shift the microphone to Eileen? I mean, she is our expert on, on tourism. Huh? Uh, perhaps uh, she would like to start off with this question and I can add a few thoughts if I have any on it. On, huh? Oh yeah, all right. Then uh, we start with uh, Dr. Eileen. Yeah, you have uh, fast experiences in, uh, in, in, her, in dealing with the cultural tourism. Please, Dr. Mm -hmm. Eileen. Okay, well, thank you very much, and um, thank you um, for the invitation to be here. Um, I think what we're really, um, sort of in, in terms of, of values and, and sort of engagement with values, it's, it's also an issue of um, how we shift from tourism that was very didactic around heritage or cultural tourism that was very didactic in, you know, you tell the visitors, this is the history, to one in which everyone is exploring the values. You know, we're continuing to explore values locally. We're also, um, you know, we don't have a definite, this is the story, this is what we want to tell tourists, but we're collectively with the locality, with planners, with the visitors, that sort of exploration of values, um, exploration of what this place is about, what these meanings are about, that's, that's happening as a dynamic process. And I think that's sort of probably both a major shift that can be very positive, but for those of us who are responsible for cultural heritage, those of us who are responsible for planning, it's not, it's, it's a very complex situation also to manage and, and sort of maintain um, you know, forward. But I, I think that's sort of the sort of starting point maybe um, to look at. Yes, I, if I could add to that, uh, I mean, yes, I agree a hundred percent with what Eileen has just said. I mean, sometimes you know we we hear this idea that tourism uh, can be a heritage safeguarding tool, and I think this is kind of an over, shall we say, a bit of a simplistic idea. It's kind of like talking about the lumber industry as being a tool for safeguarding forests. Only in the most exceptionally well-managed situations could this really be true. But tourism is not really managed as an industry. It is, a, it is more like a pop-up thing that just takes its, uh, that appears wherever it is possible for it to pop up. And therefore it is not a, uh, an overall an activity that is concerned with sustainability. And this is an issue that we need to uh, address in talking about heritage and culture tourism. We need to have uh, mitigate a way, we need to uh, direct tourism away from this idea that it's all about recreation and seeking thrills toward the values that Eileen was talking about. I like to talk about this as you know, participation or even citizen scientists. 
whenever you do a, a survey of people who come to cultural sites and you ask them what they would like, virtually the, the unanimous answer is they want to be involved with the heritage, they want to participate in the cultural life of the community, and they want to contribute to the conservation. So we should take that seriously as, as how we should direct the future of uh, tourism at heritage sites. Now, we have the opportunity now with COVID to actually do that. Uh, it's not going to obvious, not obvious, it's obviously not going to be a situation where tourism is going to boom back as quickly as possible. It's coming back very slowly, so we have a possibility of managing. And we can see in other circumstances that uh, tourists do accept uh, the need for restrictions, they do accept the, that there is a necessity to pay for the experience uh, if they can understand what the value is that they are paying for and what they're experiencing. I mean, a very good example of this is the number of people who will pay almost anything to climb Mount Everest. The value is very clear to them. They understand that they have to pay for that value to maintain this uh, mountain and they understand that they have to accept restrictions on their activities. Now, if it can apply to Mount Everest, it can apply to any heritage site. And we need to use that kind of an approach as we now try to, to uh, reinvent heritage tourism in a post COVID situation, not just fall back into the trap of, of thinking that numbers means success. That's what I. Thanks, Richard, and thanks, Dr. Eileen. Uh, those are inspiring to add to, to listen from Richard, especially that how we should use this uh, COVID uh, crisis as a, a way to reinvent our cultural tourism and the cultural tourism industry, and how actually we should uh, encourage the public participation in this uh, visiting of heritage objects, heritage communities, heritage sites as they're part of their education, part of their uh, involvement to further up to better this, uh, our, our, our world heritage. And uh, Bucha Ari, do you, what do you think that uh, what we have, I, I believe in Indonesia, we have achieved some uh, progress in dealing with this issue of how to, to deal with mass tourism. Maybe you should, you could share some, some lights on some examples. Well, uh, thank you, Pak uh, Suhardi. I think if we talk about the tourism, I think no other choice than uh, as a, a heritage conservation practitioner, uh, we have to choose the what we call a cultural tourism. And uh, this is uh, happening, I mean, uh, in Indonesia or some uh, some priority of uh, touristic places in Indonesia that uh, the government's uh, target is the number of the tourists. So this is really sad to know that uh, uh, I think from uh, the, the point of us, it's not the, the number of tourists or the mass tourism that we would like to create to uh, protect our heritage. And uh, I, I like also the, the quote from uh, other friends that usually mention tourism, it should be placed as a bonus. It's not a destination, it's not uh, the aim goal that we would like to achieve. But if we already started uh, to make our heritage conserve and it's not only physically as uh, now we talk about the shifting paradigm. So it means that we also include the activities of the people, the tradition still uh, going on. So then this, the one will attract uh, people to know more. And it also can be uh, the meaning of the selected of tourism who would like to come to this kind of heritage places. So that is uh, my, my point for this. Yeah, that's interesting. 
And uh, now when we are talking about uh, involving community and then uh, also trying to, to, to encourage the, the participation of the tourists and uh, they are they also in somehow uh, are a major uh, stakeholders in safeguarding uh, our, our heritage. And then we, have, we also knew, know that uh, the local government also has a very crucial role in, in managing the heritage. And among those uh, diverse stakeholders, Richard, do you think, which do you, do you think is the most important or, or, or should play their role more actively in, in upstreaming or in uh, introducing this paradigm shift? Well, that's kind of a, a shall we say, a, a double-edged or a triple-edged uh, sword uh, that you've uh, been asking there, because I don't think we should can say that it is one or the other, but there has to be a partnership uh, working towards shared objectives. Now, surely local government has a role to play. Why is this? And I think it's important to understand this, is because heritage resources are public assets. They're inter intergenerational assets created by past investments. And uh, the, it is the government's responsibility at various levels of governance, from local to regional to, to national to world, to ensure that they remain in the public sector and accessible, accessible to the public. So once uh, an heritage is privatized, then it no longer is heritage. It's simply a commodity uh, and it is no longer available. It's just like uh, water. The minute you put water in a bottle, a plastic bottle and sell it, it's no longer a public resource. It has become a commodity. So, so certainly local government has a role to play in that. And local government has, has a, a an, an, another role to play in activa, activating the, the specificity, the uniqueness, the individual characteristic and therefore the comparative advantage of heritage at the, lo at the locality. But they need to do this in, in, in concert with uh, multiple stakeholders in the community. And frankly speaking, government's not good at mobilizing stakeholders. Uh, they uh, do not differentiate the, the wide variety of stakeholders, nor do they take seriously the democratic responsibility to uh, empower stakeholders at different levels of, of empowerment. I mean, it, uh, much has been written over the past 40 years, 50 years now, starting with Arnstein and her latter of uh, public uh, participation, uh, about the need for effective uh, community involvement in heritage in all types of, of, of governance. Hmm? And this applies also to the governance of heritage resources. Now, we might want to think about this uh, operationally in terms of what we can do in each of our communities, because each community is going to be different throughout Indonesia, throughout the region. Uh, and this is why uh, there's a lot of interest in the conservation community in, in a very straightforward tool, which we give the name cultural mapping, which is to say that the members of the local community together identify the, the heritage resources, tangible and intangible, movable and immovable, and that uh, in each community, therefore, a, a, a a specific place-based strategy is developed for the most appropriate uh, utilization, care, maintenance, and further development of those resources. Now, I actually have recently published a book on this with Walter Jamison, who is, as you all know, a, a global tourism guru, in which we've taken about 100 cases from around uh, Asia and looked at how local communities have attempted to do this, identify resources, ask the question, what the, can they do to uh, uh, leverage the comparative advantage of those resources, not just for tourism, but for better 
uh, development and, the, and improved well-being of the members of their community. And we can find that there are many good examples and lots of failed examples. And we need to look at these different examples and try to uh, learn from them what are the, the basics. And I think that instead of trying to find a magic bullet, that one that will solve all of the problems, we actually have to approach this in a very, very much place uh, specific uh, context so that every solution is going to be different. Yes, we can learn by analogy and uh, from other places, but every place is going to have to put in the effort and the work and the resources to develop the best solution for the local uh, uh, community. And one way we can know whether this solution is working or not is together with our cultural mapping, we can also uh, start to pay more attention to carrying capacity, not just the physical carrying capacity of our communities and their resources, including their heritage resources, natural and cultural, but also the, the psychological carrying capacity, the emotional carrying capacity, the environmental carrying capacity, all these different aspects that contribute uh, collectively to the, the mosaic of well-being that we associate with a community, and in fact, which are the building blocks of the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal. And Richard, when you, you mentioned about the book that you are writing on, or it, has it been published? Yes, yes, I can, at the end of this presentation, I can flash the, it up on the screen for you. It's available online to everyone. Huh? Uh, Fantastic. So, huh? Fantastic. And uh, Dr. Eileen, would you please share some lights on uh, Richard's uh, or, or, or on Richard's uh, comments or, or on the topic that uh, we just talked about, how to, which shareholder or which stakeholder should play the most active role in this part of, let's say, in this new approach of this or, or this new paradigm shift? Yes, absolutely. I think I, I just want to bring up one point first, and I think that goes back to earlier. I mean, we it's slightly romanticized that we know that visitors like sharing experiences, like experiencing heritage and, and living heritage. And I think that this is one of the outcomes as we've shifted from monument conservation to understanding, you know, the lived in heritage, if you like, and, and we have visitors um, coming and enjoying places and engaging and embedding with cultural heritage. But I think, you know, I take that with a bit of cynicism where it's also the Instagram age and, you know, are they doing it because they want to learn about your heritage or because it makes a good Instagram post and they're an influencer or they want to be an influencer. And, you know, so, you know, there's a lot of a psychology to our current culture that is also consuming heritage as a form of media um, and media production um, and the way it, it's sort of then portrayed to their friends or their world of, of sort of through social media. So I think just sort of, yes, there are tourists who genuinely engage with and appreciate culture and to be part of that experience. Um, is you know we've sort of tired out of buying objects so we now go around buying experiences and and so on but i think we also need to be cautious about um, the motives behind some of these these tourism um richard alluded to a number of uh, planning tools we're all learning these tools as we go along um, whether it's cultural mapping whether it's stakeholder mapping whether it's tools of um, of local engagement but actually a lot of what we do happens while we're thinking about these, these planning exercises. You know, um, take, forget an archeological site, but if you look at a historic town, for example, who are the stakeholders? You know, are they the people who live there now? Are they the people whose ancestors live there? Um, are they people who come and visit it on a daily basis to do their shopping and pass through it? The, the list, the people, are, are endless and, and how do you go about capturing their link to the place, their sort of, and quite often 
things while they're there, we take for granted. We don't articulate them. We don't say we love the corner shop. It's only when the corner shop closes that we go, oh, we love that corner shop. It was really important to us. It was part of our, our heritage. So, you know, we often only articulate things when they're lost rather than when we have them. So if we're cultural planners, that's quite difficult to engage with people to understand what places and spaces mean to them because they don't necessarily articulate it. Um, so, you know, we have this sort of vast array um, of, of groups and of people, um, of, of managers, of management tools, if you like, that, that we're sort of engaging with. So I think, and yet most of what happens, and, and Richard, I'm you know really looking forward to reading your book, but I can imagine sort of second guess some of the things that go wrong because life happens while we're planning it. Um, and the same thing goes for cultural heritage and, and management in that um, we uh, things sort of go, you know, tourists arrive, someone builds a hotel while we're trying to still working out everyone to articulate their values and so on. So I think we need to also think about, um, you know, think about planning simultaneously at sort of micro level at meso level and macro levels so we've got the big strategic planning happening maybe at, in certain levels of governance um, but at the same time we've also got sort of what i call enablers things that can support small businesses you know so a local authority also has the tools to support um local businesses and, and sort of enable sort of certain push um, that benefits both um, local participation as well as support resilience and, and sustainability um, and the like. So I think, you know, we have to do the ad hoc dynamic, able to respond flexible approach as well as, you know, engage in some of these sort of bigger strategic um, thinking type, type approaches with sort of multiple stakeholders. Yeah, and, and Dr. Eileen, you, in your uh, comment just now, you, you highlight uh, the term uh, planning so, uh, and, and draw from your experiences in the UK as, uh, as being chairman or chairwoman in, in some committees related to training, education, and also drawing from your experiences working in many international projects. How would you say uh, uh, the specific role of, of planning that could be uh, that could play, that planning could play in, in spearheading this uh, paradigm shift? Um, I think there's sort of two different aspects of planning. One is I, I strongly, I'm an architect and I strongly believe um, that um, spatial approaches, particularly to cultural heritage and cultural heritage places is really important. So that we maintain a physical understanding um, and strategy going forward. We also have learned, and particularly now with much bigger awareness of, of climate emergency, that um, you know, we have to think of an area that's much larger than the boundaries of, of the site. Um, I was working in Petra, I managed the, the management plan process for Petra in Jordan, for example. The site is in the middle of a valley, it floods. But unless we manage the flood water at the watershed, which is in another province, mm -hmm. we cannot manage the flooding in the site. So we have to have the governance authorities from the neighboring province who are building roads that create more water coming in, et cetera. You know, so planning is big. You know, when we talk about things like territorial planning, we're not joking. It's not just about the World Heritage Site boundaries and a buffer zone, but it's actually about thinking very, very strategically um, in, in that sense. So I think physical spatial planning and, and sort of looking big in terms of strategies is really important. On the other hand, Part of our paradigm shift is this sort of values based approach that, you know, multiple voices, multiple stories, um, you know, different people value things differently, you know, so we're very, we're becoming much more pluralist in that sense. 
I think the problem we have at the moment is that as cultural heritage professionals, we haven't mastered it yet. We're still learning. You know, how do we give a voice to these different values? How do we represent them? How do we then act on them? How do we give them a voice? So until we sort of learn how to do it, if you like, how do we then teach it to planning professionals um, and other, dis you know, we're increasingly engaging them in these practices, but I think we're also still on a learning curve. We don't have a full um, method of saying, this is how we do it. This is how you represent different values. This is how you work with everyone. So in that sense, I think it's, um, it is really important that we also master how we go about it as we're working with planners. Increasingly, I'm finding even on sort of quite smaller monument sort of focus projects that there's a lot to learn from the urban planning discipline and the way they approach things like engagement and planning that's, that's sort of now going far beyond the sort of more traditional um, historic sort of formats um, of, of engagement um, and looking at it from many points of view. So traditionally, again, in cultural heritage, we've tended to look to nature conservation, our colleagues in IUCN and, and other forms and national park management and saying, well, there's some good management lessons. But I think we should also be looking at how planning is particularly now very much at the forefront of, of sort of dynamic planning practices, um, tactical urbanism, you know, lots of different uh, methods are appearing and I think as much as anything we also need to learn how we can adapt those in into the cultural heritage field and sort of work a lot more collaboratively between shifting them into thinking through our values based approaches but also learning from from some of their approaches. Excellent and uh, I think uh, you just highlight uh, the importance to understand that uh, there is that uh, planning has really uh, an important role to play and that uh, all of us who involved in this heritage management issues or practices should uh, continue to think in multidisciplinary way and should uh, uh, support the idea of, of, of involving other experts, other, uh, other uh, fields in, 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 in helping us to, to deal with the current challenges, and especially when uh, the climate change and uh, the, the the nature uh, risk preparedness and uh, how to reach the SDG goals uh, by 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 uh, through safeguarding our heritage. And I just realized that uh, your 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 view just now is very much uh, related to what uh, Richard has uh, expressed in in early of his presentation, and re I really love it that he said, uh, and I think both of you said in a, in a, in a very clear way that uh, when we talk about paradigm shift, it is not to, it is wrong to, 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 to feel that one is better than the other or, 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 or there is, uh, or one is, it, uh, or there is the best from, from, from both of them, but we should feel this uh, two approach, just like you said, in, in these two planning spheres, as a coexist, which Richard say is coexist, and they are they are both should be used, both either uh, both the uh, approaching it through the monument based approach, and the other is how this uh, a planning sphere of treating heritage as monuments, as space, as geographical uh, entities should be also balanced with our understanding as. Uh, practitioners or as researchers to feel heritage management as also should involve the values uh, derived from uh, the communities, from 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 the local stakeholders. And Abu Chatrini, I un understand you are also a researcher. Maybe you should you could share with us what are the current discourse in Indonesia, the current development in our views, how to how to see the the role of planning in addressing this paradigm shift. Please. Thank you. Well, uh, allow me to highlight the paradigm shifting basically in heritage conservation practicing. So the shifting from the single object or monument base to be the area base 
and from the fabric base to be the value base in Indonesia. So I think this is support the understanding of the conservations, which is not about recovery of some original form, but about the management of change. And uh, as mentioned by maybe we all still remember Aswart, yeah? it's very uh, popular that he said that conservation is about the management of change. So I think this is true that uh, this is not, uh, we talk about the monument of the physical things, but uh, it's widely. And uh, if I can also say here to uh, refresh all of you, uh, that uh, there is a dramatically demonstrated at the grid, maybe you still remember Shinto Shrine in Japan, as we say, which is uh, torn down and uh, rebuilt uh, every 20 years precisely to ensure its survival in spite of the natural decay of timber. So I think this is the tradition in this sense implies a cycle of dynamic change. And uh, this is involving not only the physical fabric of the shrine, but also the intangible heritage of knowledge and skill. And this is the important one. So this is the value which lie behind the effort by the community to preserve uh, both of the fabric and the knowledge. And if I can say here, the shift paradigm in Indonesia example, I think uh, I, I learned a lot also from Aceh. Yeah? This is the research of uh, Ibu Chut Dewi in Aceh. It is uh, in the aftermath of the devastating tsunami in 26 December 2004, for example, the Baitur Rahman Mosque in Bada Aceh was rebuilt. And it is rebuilt in a style which incorporated several key architectural changes. And uh, what happened? So the local communities then have no problem to continue their prayer. There. So they did not dispute these changes since they understood that the authenticity of the mosque architecture is not merely a matter of physical appearance, but extend to the activities and function which still permit. So, and I think I can also point out uh, this is also happened in some other area in Indonesia, such as uh, the Borobudur Temple itself, when uh, it's uh, renovated. Uh, there are also some new material, but this is uh, having a marker which one is the new material and which one is still the original one. So uh, I think I would like to also highlight here that's, that's a good example. But uh, we also have uh, the, another case. So in terms of uh, how the uh, paradigm shift things, uh, we're understanding about the value more than the physical one. So uh, if I may, I also have the example in Trogulan. This is uh, my research for my uh, PhD program. So the government there uh, having a program named Majapahit Houses Program. So construction of 600 houses and uh, the houses is in Majapahit style according to the government. And uh, it's aimed to enhance the site by constructing uh, this facade on the existing residence of the local community. And uh, in the three years after the project dance, most of the several hundred residents in the program are now deserted and unused. So sorry to say. So then this is uh, the failure of this program stem from both its design and its application. So I can uh, see also uh, here that's in the particular, if we can see the program adopted a very simple view of authenticity. So the, the paradigm to uh, acknowledge the authenticity to be wider. So uh, the, uh, the, the government maybe uh, thought uh, they paying attention to the cultural value of the site and the locality through only the physical things that they built in front of its houses there. So this mistake was a result of a top-down design uh, which made no attempt to involve the local community. And then these uh, two aspects of the failure are closely also related. So I think uh, what I can uh, underline here is the importance you now attached of uh, what we call it uh, the value in the approach of heritage conservation. So this is really demand that uh, local communities uh, can be understand what the value and then what the ownership of the they have to their own heritage. So this is uh, several uh, experience learned in Indonesia.
maybe we can also have a discussion about this, I think. That's interesting, uh, Bu Ari. And uh, this bring me to, 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 to Dr. Eileen, and uh, I, I would like to hear your, your, your view on this uh, paradigm shift, as, I, as we know that uh, you ever worked in uh, Turkey in a Pergamon project. And as we know, Turkey is, has a unique position between Europe and, and Asia. And uh, both uh, continents have different sets of values, different sets of, uh, let's say, frameworks in appreciating their, their, their heritage. And uh, do you have any com uh, any unique experience in in, in 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 dealing with this matter in in when in your job in in your work in Turkey? Um, I think we can probably go beyond Turkey, but um, right. one thing. But I think it is a good example because um, if you look at the position of Anatolia, it's it's somewhere that many civilizations pass through. There's a lot of human migration for thousands of years passing through that part of the world. And of course, there are therefore sort of multiple heritage narratives, multiple, you know, and what we often think about as sort of con contested heritage, you know, whose heritage, which civilization, um, from DNA analysis, we now know that the people themselves actually stayed quite stable, um, and it was the sort of the Alexander the Great and the various Mughal empires sort of passing through that, that changed things. But I think that sort of shows us this big question about narrative and, you know, who determines the narrative of what heritage is um, and you know, how people identify with it today is, is very much influenced by um, national narrative or narratives they are being feed, fed, whether that's you know, via Twitter these days or, or, or other things. So I think it's, it's also, you know, it is, a, it is a minefield, you know, and I think what we've got is actually globally two, two systems at play. One is um, the system that that different cultures have, and I I would I think agree with Richard here. We can't just say East and West. Even within each country, within each culture, there's a different approach to cultural heritage, how it's valued, uh, what makes it important. Of course, that causes a lot of headache if you like when you get to something like a World Heritage Committee, where there's sort of uh, guidance that's trying to get get everything to the same, same level. So we've got um, is a sort of cultural variation globally. So there's culturally different ways of approaching our past, the relics of that past, which is sort of the cultural heritage. Um, you know, we've been hearing a lot about Africa recently where culture and nature are one, you cannot separate them. It's a very artificial thing to, to separate it. Um, in the Western tradition, those two are separated to a degree and, and so on. So there's this sort of different approach to how we all view cultural heritage and how in a globalized world we deal with these differences. But secondly, I think what's emerging even more in this book is that there's sort of two political uh, positions. One is a political position that says we own up to the past we interrogate it, were we involved in the slave trade? Let's have a look at it. Let's acknowledge lesser aspects of, of cultural heritage. And then there's a very uh, dominant sort of government now saying that there is one narrative and if you fall beyond that narrative, um, you know, you cannot say anything about our past that doesn't fit that official narrative of the past. So. We have sort of these two mechanisms of, of value determination um, as far as cultural heritage. The one is the sort of the cultural one and, and one is the political one. So, you know, I think that's that's a sort of very interesting now that that sort of there's, there's this growing confrontation with things in the US, um, you know, take Singapore Botanical Gardens, for example, recent World Heritage Site, you know, they're celebrated as gardens and landscape and cultural thing, but they are a colonial legacy. You know, there's, an, there's another story. Now, is that story going to be told? Um, you know, 
often politics are sort of quite against telling telling these these stories. Um, countries like the Uni United Arab Emirates, they have very strict, and I and I know other countries in, in Southeast Asia as well, um, and China, of course, you know, where there is a very strict control on the narrative of history and, and heritage. So there's also um, that sort of political thing that, that also plays a huge role in, in what is valued and therefore the message on what is valued is also, you know, so is it as pluralistic or, or expressive as, as we, we think it is or not? So I think that's, that's also worth bearing in mind. Yeah, and uh, by the way, uh, similar to our colleagues, our friends in Africa, we in Indonesia, we also value our heritage as inseparable between the built, the physical heritage and the natural heritage. And uh, uh, we all know that uh, even we have now a, a new, our own term for this, uh, what's so called the cultural landscape as a Saujana landscape in, in, in Indonesia. And we are lucky here to have uh, Ibu uh, Laretna Sita Disakti from Yogyakarta. And, uh, uh, later on, Bu, Bu Sita, please get ready. I would like to have some of your views here. And But uh, now I would like to go to Richard. And since uh, Dr. Eileen talked uh, just now uh, some of her insights on this, uh, uh, which are more related to the method. And uh, I would like to, to, to hear your, your, your views on how should we, what kind of method of conservation that we should develop in, in dealing or to, to base this method on the local context in dealing with this paradigm shift. What would you suggest to us? Okay, I mean, this is a, this is a, a an in-depth question, but let me try to answer it as, as, as short and sweet as I possibly can. Uh, I mean, it is, of course, I would say, obvious beyond the need to state it, that every heritage site and every heritage expression, uh, whether it be a, a type of textile or a dance or whatever, each one is individual in itself. And therefore each one will require uh, a different approach to its safeguarding, to its conservation, to its replication, to its utilization, depending on uh, its context, and its context is not only its geographical and its, its present context, but it's also the historical context, the experience of its use, and the anticipation of its future use. So certainly every place is, uh, is different. But that is not to say that any approach is just as good as any other approach, even though we will, we can no doubt uh, look toward the successes of past conservation approaches to, to guide us as an entry point. But let's take the, the example of the medical profession, okay? Uh, I think the medical profession provides a very good analogy to the heritage safeguarding profession, where we're in both professions, we're trying to prolong the life of something uh, that is subject to change and decay over time, that has many, many factors, external and internal, that are uh, causing this, and that there are many different contexts to this. Some of them cultural, some of them environmental, some of them political, many, many different contexts. Now, of course, every single person needs to take care of their own physical health in terms of what they eat, what they exercise, uh, uh, and the various vulnerabilities each person has. But that is not to say there are not some basics. No matter who you are, if you, if you uh, drink dirty water, you're going to get sick. If you jump off a 30-foot cliff, you're going to break your neck. So, I mean, there are certainly definite limits to practice. So to say that just any kind of derived practice is as good as any other derived practice is simply a logical error of, of thinking. It's not true. Uh, but uh, 
And so then we can start to hone down into what are more successful practices, what are the better practices, what are the less successful practices, and in what circumstances does what work best. Now, actually, this involves then a much larger reflection on the, on the profession of heritage management. And the reason this is, is because uh, all survey of the, the state of conservation of heritage sites everywhere in the world, there, is, there aren't exceptions to this, huh? that the heritage resources are degrading. They're not getting better. The efforts we are putting in are not keeping up with the degradation of the resources. So this means that as a profession of managers, whether we're expert managers, whether we're political managers, we're local community managers, we're not doing the job we need to be doing to prolong the life of our heritage. The life expectancy of heritage is going down. Our profession is not competent, not sufficiently competent for the task at hand. And so uh, IUCN and ICOMOS uh, have uh, been thinking about this and how to address this for quite some time. IUCN took the lead in developing a competency framework, which is kind of a starts off as a diagnosis of, of what uh, skills are needed and where are the gaps in knowledge at what levels of management and among which kinds of uh, stakeholder managers and how we can fill those gaps. ICOMOS has followed up on this and recently with the UNESCO Bangkok, a, 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 a competency framework for cultural heritage managers has been uh, published and is the basis now of a a global training exercise that some of our participants listening here have recently participated in. Uh, the issue is that in fact, we are not skilled in the diversity as a profession, not as individuals, but as a profession, we do not have the range of skills necessary to, to deal with all the tasks at hand. We have focused on specialized technical skills and yes, many of us are good archaeologists and good architects uh, and good stone conservators and good, uh, I don't know, documentalists or whatever. Huh? Uh, many of us have very good technical skills, but very few of us have very good managerial skills, people managerial skills, financial resource management skills, knowledge management skills, and very few of us have the planning tools and science skills that Eileen was talking about. In fact, we need to address seriously a systematic professionalization of heritage management. Uh, from the top down of the most kind of executive levels to the level of specialists, to the level of public health, that is to say community-based heritage uh, stewardship. Uh, and, and this involves knowledge of technical skills, yes, managerial skills, some basic uh, uh, knowledge of how heritage fits into a global system of environment, of history, of society, of sustainable development. In addition, there are necessary personal skills. And some of those personal skills are kinds of things that the lack of those are kinds of things that that underlie some of the ideas that that uh, Eileen was worrying about in her comments about the conflict or the politic politicization of of uh, public resources. And to me, I think this has to do with, a, with basic lack of skill in governance. 
because governance has to do with creating the greatest good for the greatest number of people, and that has to do with diversity management. And, uh, it doesn't have to do with narrowing objectives. That's that's called it might be called dictatorship, or it might be called uh, uh, robbery, or it might be called I don't know what uh, you want to call it. But anyway, the narrowing of things is is not what we are talking about when we're talking about good governance. We're talking about the, the broadening of the dialogue. But those skills in governance are largely lacking um, as applied to heritage resources. And in fact, we, have, we are in a situation like the medical profession was at the end of the 19th century, where yes, there were lots of skills developing, lots of science was happening about bacteriology and, and this kind of thing. Uh, uh, but it was a, basically a free-for-all. There were a lot of quack doc doctors. The uh, public, the patients could not tell the difference between who was a qualified doctor and who was an unqualified doctor. A doctor who might be qualified to, to set a bone was called in to uh, cure the bubonic plague. Uh, there was all sorts of, shall we say, disorganization among the knowledge management and its application in the profession. And I have to say, I think this is where we are at the moment in heritage management. And this is the, this is the challenge for our generation, or not really for my generation, but for the generation that's younger than I am, of how to organize the professionalization of this so that the heritage assets do are continued, we do not lose them, and that they the, our investment in the past is able to sustain us into the future. We have not achieved that yet. And by approaching it in a very kind of dissipated, uh, disparate, unorganized, unsystematic, and unplanned way, we're never going to succeed to the level that we need to succeed. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you bring up this issue of how important to increase our own capacity as heritage practitioners or managers uh, in, a, where in, a, in a more systematic, organized way of, of training ourselves. And uh, I'm glad I would like to, to, to share with you and Dr. Eileen that uh, we are lucky to have our colleagues here from Indonesia also uh, that they are also uh, most of them are academicians also besides they are practitioners and uh, we also uh, are very glad that uh, our colleague in NUS Dr. Johannes Widodo is very active in promoting the importance of what just Richard say that we ourselves as heritage activists practitioners should look into ourselves assess ourselves and and then uh, support this idea of how to, to, to increase our own capacity in a more systematic way, how we should train ourselves as more to the managerial level rather than only focus on our technical skills in our own respective field. And uh, maybe Dr. Eileen, you would like to share some uh, brief uh, comments on what Richard just said, as you are also educators. I was, if you noticed, I was hastily writing down uh, <laughs> sort of things you were saying, but I think to me, it's also very interesting hearing your experiences in Indonesia, um, and it gives me um, an, another perspective. I think, you know, the issues we face with education, the questions, I mean, I agree with Richard that we're, you know, we're nowhere near there yet. We have, um, you know, there's a lot of um, sort of, uh, disparity between different uh, sectors, uh, sections of the sector, if you like. Um, but I think in education, again, we face the issue of we have the conservation professionals we're educating, we have the heritage management, uh, future heritage managers that we're, we're educating in sort of very specific designated courses. But at the same time, we have to work with planners, we have to work with politicians, and time and time and again, we, we start asking the question, how do we get the message through, you know, how do we infiltrate their education systems to take on, um, to take on heritage? Um, you know, we've seen this in England from, 
you know, we, the National Trust suddenly appoints someone to manage a property and in their previous job, they were managing a supermarket, um, you know, be, but they have all the rights management credentials. Um, and I'm not saying they did a bad job, but it's a steep learning curve coming in to very different environments. So again, I think right back, going back to the SDGs where, you know, we all, I think many of us feel a bit trapped that cultural heritage is 11.4 and not explicitly running through the other SDGs. And I think the same goes for education where we're, we have education in the, you know, we're, we're training people with a very cultural background in cultural heritage management, but we're not making people who often do end up becoming the managers um, more heritage aware um, and understanding that we're not, you know, if you look at a traditional management system, it says, you know, if you're managing factories, you build more factories, you make more of the goods, you sell more of those. Well, you can't do that with cultural heritage. You can't just increase tourism numbers. The resource is finite, you end up damaging it, and then you've got no resource. You know, uh, local communities are fragile, they have breaking points. You know, you can't just you can't double up, you can't bring in more. So it's a very different sensitivity that, that's necessary. Unfortunately, I mean, I don't have the answers um, per se, but it, and in, in how do we bring more, how do we mainstream cultural heritage? I think is the question, whether it's on SDGs, whether it's on education, whether it's on public awareness, you know, that it, that it becomes not a specific area, but it is part of our everyday, whether it's about a driver for development, um, also sort of our everyday reality. In a way, some of this paradigm shift, some of this ident the identification that, and I think again, what Richard was saying, it's not just the, the palaces of the princes, but also what your grandparents did is also part of, uh, of cultural heritage, but yeah. I don't have an answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, and uh, for your information, uh, Richard and uh, Eileen, that uh, Ibu Chatrini also is representing currently uh, Indonesian Heritage Trust, working together with us in ICOMOS, uh, trying, we are trying to develop a, a, a training uh, uh, contents that we call a Heritage Academy that would like to, to, to uh, that, that we will launch uh, to help uh, our colleagues all around Indonesia, especially our 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 friends who are involved in the, in the government sectors, in a, in 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 academicians, also in practitioners, which are far away from, especially who are far away from 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 the center of the action, which is in Java, that uh, that should be uh, a, a specialized, a custom made kind of uh, training to to address the issues that you and uh, Richard just uh, that Eileen and Richard just just highlight. And, uh, and 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 for that matter, maybe Ibu Chatrini would like to add on some. We add up something. Well, so I think for the training, I think it's also welcome to Richard and Eileen maybe to yes. also contribute uh, to this training. Maybe later we can inform you again. Yeah, but if I may, I would like also to highlight uh, several things from Richard and Eileen that uh, I do agree. So it's about uh, how we see the present day conservation. So I think I myself also agree that the approach uh, attempt to, to marry the Western and Eastern strategies, yeah? So the assessment of conservation practices is now similar in project in both of East and West. So then uh, I also agree that the priority in each case uh, have been to bring out the original vision of the value of the site. I mean, so, uh, the for instance, the original value of uh, each site that despite all the transformation of the building that have undergone over the year. So it's not talking about the reconstruction, renovation, or uh, make it uh, another function, but uh, also uh, how is the transformation is really related with the value. So then the key point of the concept is the understanding of the value that underpin the heritage object the world offer. And uh, for me also, it is important that the way in which conservation is practiced should be uh, predicated on beliefs and on the ways such beliefs are conceived 
and also constructed by local communities. So I also bring it up uh, the priority if we talk about the communities and uh, this is a part of the, the effort to redefine our understanding of the heritage conservation that it should be based on the local communities ownership of uh, their own heritage. So such an informed acknowledgement of a living traditions as an authentic spirit of the physical form of a given heritage site. A sense of place can arise from a connection between the physical and non-physical aspect of the site. And there must also be a room for flexibility. So I underlined uh, the flexibility because this is in expanding the way in which the concept of development of historic places is interpreted among the stakeholder. And most of the mystic is coming from this room of flexibility. So it is our task to stimulate a more wide ranging uh, argument on how to manage such heritage conservation by integrating uh, the twin prism of this value. And this, the cases that I mentioned in Indonesia uh, before, it's so how this notion of shifting paradigm as uh, we understand from uh, Richard's presentation, uh, it's not only belong to the prince, and so this is not only the single object or monument things, but goes to the area base. And then from the fabric base to the value base. So this is really experience challenges. Also, uh, if in the, in, the, in the practice area, and they have to come in uh, some time, it also come into conflict with the present day conservation practices. So what I mean about the flexibility is uh, how the, this flexibility room is the the key to the development of balance. So the balance among the heritage policy. And then one way of achieving this flexibility is by giving the local communities the chance to mediate their own heritage related dispute and personally participate in the practice of the heritage conservation. So only then so will a common policy will be achieved. And then also as a heritage practitioner and also as well the heritage expert and uh, local communities find a way of working together to achieve sustainable outcomes. So this is uh, what I would like also to add. Um, could I add something very sure. quickly that as listening to Ari, I have, uh, I have had a sort of a, a collateral thought. And I think it's a very relevant to what she has just said. And it is that we, we tend to focus when we do heritage conservation on the inputs. What can we do to make something better? How can we safeguard it? What inputs do we need to uh, put into the system? But we very, very infrequently ask, what, is, what are the outputs that we expect from this? What is the change situation? And how do we expect it to be better at the end? In fact, uh, one of the I, I cannot think, in fact, of any uh, operational heritage management plan for a world heritage site that I know of from uh, around Asia, where there is a coherent statement of expected outputs from the inputs that are enumerated often in great detail in these management plans. Hmm? Uh, so I think that, and partially, partially, I do think that this is a, an, a, a matter of the reluctance of that we all have to be criticized and to accept criticism mm -hmm. and to understand that perhaps we are, we have failed or have not succeeded to the degree we wish to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that this is something that is very necessary to introduce into our profession. Again, I want to take the idea of the, the um, medical profession. My father was the head doctor of a hospital for many years. Every single time a patient died, there was a, a complete analysis breakdown of what went wrong that kept that was that was that was unsuccessful 
Why did that patient die? What could they ha have been done to make it better? It was very, very critical, and often very brutal, because of course we know that pe people come to hospitals sick and old and they're going to die. But nonetheless, the crit critique of, of this was an important exercise in, in pushing forward the critical understanding of the profession. And I have to say that we don't have that very well embedded in heritage. In fact, I'm trying to think as Ari was speaking, where do we have such measures of critique anywhere? Basically, uh, the only one I can think of at the national level is in Bhutan within the gross domestic happiness, which is basically a critique of the success of cultural management hmm? in, the, in, the, in the country. Huh? Uh, otherwise, I, I, find it, I find that we are lacking in uh, this ability to, to be critical in our, uh, to set objectives and to be critical in what is keeping us from achieving those objectives to the extent we would like to be. And this is something that I think needs to be introduced into our practice at all levels. Excellent, Richard. I, I, I shared your view. And uh, I think uh, this is a very important moment that all of us in Indonesia could learn from your views and from Dr. Eileen as well and Dr. Chatrini. And uh, I believe that uh, they have been paying attention for quite some time and uh, we are we are reaching uh, almost half an hour since uh, the start of discussion. And I believe uh, many of them uh, would have some questions in their mind. And uh, for those who haven't, I would like to encourage you as participants, you could also raise uh, your question. You can type in at the chat box, or if you want to talk directly or want to ask your question, you can raise your hand. And uh, as uh, to stimulate them, I would like to 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 to, address, uh, to ask Richard with with one this uh, question uh, about uh, the investment in heritage properties, the issues that uh, all of us in 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 many cases we have dealt with either uh, investment in uh, derelict uh, properties that later on turn on to to something uh, marvelous as uh, like. Uh, historic hotels or, 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 or uh, historic apartments. And, uh, and this approach, as we know, that it is private investments mostly uh, derived their motivations from uh, viewing the, uh, those monuments uh, on a more European-centric approach of looking at the monuments as such as just as, as objects for tourists, for, for, for for the uh, upper class of society to, to enjoy it. And then on the other hand, we also understand that the current approach should also pay attention more to the value-based approach, which is more to the community uh, sphere. And how should we deal with this, or how to balance this and how to deal with this challenge? On the other one hand, we have, we know that uh, somehow we need these private investments in, in historic properties. On the other hand, we have this uh, value-based approach that we should promote. How to reconcile them, Richard? Well, I am not a heritage economist, uh, but I do have a few thoughts on this. First of all, I would like to say that, you know, we should not enter this discussion with kind of a hopeless hand wringing uh, approach. The kinds of investment and the level of, or the, not the kind, the level of investment that we are looking at to conserve heritage is very small compared to the level of investment that the government, that private sector or individuals are willing to make in any other realm of things. Whether it is investment in a new coal mine in Kalimantan or, or investment in you know, uh, a battleship or buying a new, uh, Airbus A380 for the uh, national airlines or building a multi-story uh, hotel. I mean, the kinds of investments we're talking about are clearly small potatoes. And so to say that there aren't resources for this is not true. 
The question is, why haven't, why don't we invest in our, the resources we have in this? To, to talk about Indonesia being a resource poor country that cannot afford to invest in heritage is nonsense. I mean, it's one of the richest, biggest countries in the world that spends all kinds of money doing all sorts of things. Uh, so to say that it can't spend, find money to invest in heritage is simply, I think, a, a, a red herring. Huh? But uh, so let's start with that point, that there are resources there. It's a question of how do we mobilize those resources? Now, I would say that there are kinds of three areas we need to think about this. In. One is the traditional old fashioned way of uh, na national government or central government funding, at least for monument conservation. So I say this has never really proven much of a problem. Uh, any, any country who's wanted to preserve the, the palace of their kings or the, uh, the great religious monuments of their society, they found the money to do this uh, through taxation and other ways. So in fact, the investment in monument conservation, if it is insufficient, is simply a question of poor management of finances at the government level. The, the second issue is more problematic, I think. And this is the assumption that the private sector funds can be directly mobilized for conservation of, of heritage when there's gaps in public sector financing. This is certainly an attractive idea, but it's not a particularly realistic idea in most societies. Because most societies, the private sector is governed by the bottom line of profit sharing, uh, a, a profit taking. Let me give you an example of this. Oh, 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, when Vietnam was first opening up, to uh, tourism, we had a, a, a workshop, a conference uh, on how to invest in the heritage resources of Vietnam to stimulate the cultural heritage tourism business. And interestingly, our conference was sponsored by a very famous international hotel group that was moving into Vietnam. I won't mention it, but it was one of the world's biggest hotel groups. And the general manager of that hotel group came and said to me that he would like to address the conference. And what he said was this. He said that he personally loves heritage. He personally, he personally spends all of his disposable income visiting heritage sites, staying in heritage hotels, homestays, taking his children to museums. He says virtually he spends all of his disposable income in, on culture and heritage. He said, however, his hotel group will not spend one penny on this. He said, why? Because it's a wasted penny for us because the, our competitors do not spend that same penny and therefore it is throwing money away. He said, I would be fired by my shareholders if I were to spend even one penny on heritage conservation. The only way you're gonna get the private sector to spend money on heritage conservation is to compel us to do so through taxation or some other way. He said, don't be fooled by this, he said, don't think about this going down that alley. So I have always kept that in mind. Maybe I am not quite so cynical as he, but I am not a million, multi-millionaire director of one of the world's largest corporations either. He is. So that's my second type of issue of how to deal with finance. And the third one, I think, is something that has uh, is much more hopeful, I would say, and much more realistic 
and is both traditional and, and extremely modern. And this is crowdsourcing. Let's say that. It's something that we've learned to do in the COVID environment, but it's also something that is traditional in many communities. I mean, the way that, for example, throughout Asia, Buddhist uh, temples have been conserved and maintained over generations and generations is through local merit making uh, activities, which is a form of crowdsourcing of, of funds. And when we talk about democratization of heritage resources to become ubiquitous in communities everywhere, this implies that we cannot look at the centralized uh, fund dispersal mechanisms, whether they be government or whether they be private sector driven for to finance everything we need to finance in terms of resources for heritage conservation, whether they be human resources or financial resources or, or material resource, whatever. Uh, we have to look at this crowdsourcing as an option. And this then goes back to all the things that Ari and Eileen have been talking about, about values-based uh, and shared value, uh, shared valuation of the heritage by members of the community. Because without this shared aspirational value of the future value of the heritage then crowdsourcing for its conservation, safeguarding, protection and continuation will not happen. But with that shared aspiration for the future utility, then crowdsourcing becomes a, a realistic uh, mechanism and one that can be uh, utilized in a quite equitable way. That's what I would like to comment on. Wonderful, Richard. I, I, I really uh, amazed by your, 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 your view on this third one, the crowdsourcing. And uh, I think this is something that uh, we as heritage practitioners should also uh, get inspired from those startups or those uh, 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 colleagues in, 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 in the creative business or in the technological uh, advancement business of how they use crowdsourcing. And uh, maybe Dr. Eileen, you, you have something to add on? Uh, yes, I mean, I think, you know, tourism or just a growing appreciation of cultural heritage um, means that we can use historic buildings, you know, now that we're accepting these aren't just the monuments, but there are other types of, of historic buildings. Um, you know, I'm a huge advocate of reusing buildings, um, de redeveloping them, particularly when they're redundant. So cultural heritage ap appreciation, tourism at the start really op offers us opportunities to use buildings that are no longer that functional old palaces. If you look at India, the Haveli, the big old family houses, you know, um, the families no longer have the resources to maintain them or the lifestyle with servants to live in the buildings, for example. So, you know, tourism or alternative uses provide us with the sort of double opportunity of, of conserving the monument as well as um, making sure it has a valuable new use. Um, and it adds value to the tourism experience. You know, it gives us that alternative experience which everyone is looking for so I think we can look at the value in that I think the question is who does it does the government do it do the does the private sector do it and um, India again is an, an interesting example way back in the 1980s they um, the government took some of these buildings on um, and restored them and started operating them as as hotels but they were also very honest. They said, look, we're not tourism operators. We're not, you know, we're not in the business of running, running hotels. But the reason they did it was to encourage the private sector to come on board. Because um, one thing about the private sector is they don't like taking risks. They, you know, if once something works, then they're all there and they'll want to pour their money in. But like Richard's um, hotel chain, they don't want to spend one extra penny on something they might lose. So, um, you know, in a way, 
that might be the right way uh, in the fact that the private sector knows how to, you know, the visitor experience, the right quality of room for the star rating or whatever, that they're probably better place to do that. What governments can, the roles governments can play are, are twofold. One is as a gatekeeper, they can make sure that the heritage is conserved in the proper way when they they do these deals when they check on these these how uh, uh, buildings are being converted and, and adapted but they can also be enablers and um, you know they can help um, support uh, you know do they give better options for local investors for example rather than international investors you know, by saying, if you're from this place and you want to restore your ancestral home or take on a building, then we give you some tax breaks or, you know, enable in some way, which the outside organisation that coming in doesn't benefit from. Unfortunately, a lot of models these days is that the outside big giant chain or coming in gets better benefits from the government than the local investors so but that's a gift that's in the hands of government local or national government to say we're going to create these conditions um, in which local investors are able to sort of convert buildings at the end of the day we'll always have problems that you know once tourism takes off you can see this right the way across asia you know then it becomes a bandwagon and no one people stop living in their historic houses in historic towns for example because they all want to convert them in into tourism businesses so then we have a new problem that they stop being lived in places they just become full of full of tourist shops and again it's very difficult to say to people it's all right your neighbor's making a lot of money from tourism but you can't because the quotas is full um, in China, they tried um, sort of what I call social engineering in saying, making local people, if they're going to get grants to restore their houses, they had to go on living in them and not rent them out to tourism businesses. But um, the penalty was so small that everyone just pays the penalty and moves out. That you can't make people do things just because it satisfies certain things. So, you know, conversion comes with its problems but we you know if properly managed and, and particularly the authorities whether they're the planning authorities giving permission for restoration or government supporting with tax or funding and, and and things like that there are opportunities that not the heritage is conserved and it enables a lot of different and various groups to engage with it in a sort of positive way yeah all right Thank you for your view, Eileen and Richard and Satrini. And uh, now I think I would like to open up the discussion with uh, for our colleagues here. Anybody would like to raise or would like to comment or would like to share their view on today's uh, topic on this paradigm shift? Please raise your hand. Then uh, the co-host will unmute you. Anybody would like to share their views or want to raise questions for Chatrini, Richard, or Eileen? And while waiting for them, I would like, uh, in the list of participants, I see some of our foreign guests. I would like to say hello to Lawrence Law from Georgetown, Penang, and also for Luigi Cipolla. And of course, a very warm greetings to all my colleagues from e-commerce, from e-commerce Indonesia and from Indonesia Heritage Trust. And once again, please come join us, share some of your views and your, your thoughts, or you want to ask questions directly to Eileen or Richard or Chatrini. Please, we have 15 minutes uh, before uh, Ibu Titin will We'll close this discussion. Or if you like to type it in Bahasa in the chat room, please go ahead. I would translate your, your questions or your thoughts uh, to in, into English and address them to Richard and Eileen.
All right, then maybe I should encourage our audience with one question of my own then. And, uh, and uh, yes, what we have uh, talked about uh, in, in brief uh, before we start this discussion formally, uh, that we know that uh, one of the uh, recommended approach in, in addressing or uh, in, in adopting this paradigm shift is through the UNESCO recommended historic urban landscape approach in which just like Richard mentioned in, the, in, in, in earlier stage that it involves uh, the practice of cultural mapping of uh, public participatory planning of how to give uh, space for the community itself to redefine uh, the values of their heritage. And then on the other hand, here in Indonesia, we have had uh, some uh, recent developments where many mayors who govern their own, uh, uh, which uh, in their own city, they have their historic towns and they are encouraged by the successes of uh, old town of Semarang in revitalizing their heritage resources. And suddenly nowadays they are competing of uh, revitalizing their, their own heritage by looking up to Samara as an example, and they do it in more to the uh, uh, politician style of managing change by expecting quick results, instant success, and by trying to uh, and, and, and not giving enough space and time for the practice of cultural mapping, of uh, town hall meeting, of public participation. Then, what do you? think of this, uh, how should, should we as heritage activists and practitioners in Indonesia uh, uh, addressing this challenge, Richard and Eileen? Maybe Richard would like to start, or oh, Eileen, please, please. I mean, I think this is a global problem. I'm obviously not hugely familiar with um, Indonesia's specifics, but um, if you think of the global problem, we, in, in, in theory, in academia, we advocate engagement, we have all these systems, in place, but managing it on the ground, paying for it, allowing the time for it to happen, are all huge challenges. And I mean, think of yourself as a community member as well. You know, how much time have you got for engagement activities? How many town hall meetings can you go to? You know, some of it's about heritage, some of it's about a power station, some of it's about, you know, it, I think you also sort of need to think about it from um, the participant point of view, particularly in poorer communities, time is essential to earn a living, to feed your children, you know, how are people, you know, we need to also make engagement um, better and more practicable. And I think we need to start thinking about sort of more rapid systems of engagement using technology, using apps, for example, you know, that we have, you know, rather than this whole sort of physicality of bringing everyone into places, but how do we break them down into groups? Do we have informants do we work with informants who go and collect information within local communities uh, and so we have a sort of cascading system but i think you know in our sort of planning toolbox we also need to think about being more practicable and making use of modern technology um, to achieve that interesting there I mean, might be younger people in the audience who have yes. a better idea on this than I do. Yes, and maybe Richard, you want to add on? Well, I will only make a very short comment, and that comment is that I think that um, we have around Southeast Asia some very good examples of, of this, how to deal with this uh, political necessity for quick results and the, and the issue of long-term sustainable development planning. Uh, one of these is in Vigan in the Philippines, which is, has been cited by ECOMOS and by the World Heritage Committee uh, for its uh, excellent long-term sustainable ma uh, development plans based on heritage management. And the other one is Georgetown in Malaysia. Now I know that Lawrence Lowe is 
among our uh, audience. And I think I would like to turn over the microphone to him to have him comment because he has for the last, now how many years, Lawrence? Uh, 20 years, 30 years been uh, uh, shepherding this project uh, through uh, Georgetown and in other cities in Malaysia uh, to uh, a, a great deal of, of uh, success and uh, recognition globally. So could we invite yes. Lawrence to comment? Yeah, sure, uh, please. Uh, uh, Widya, would you please uh, give the microphone, uh, uh, unmute uh, Mr. Lawrence Law, please. Hi. Yes, Lawrence. Please. Hi. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, that was pretty underhanded, Richard. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to keep very quiet. Um, Go ahead, George Lawrence. Okay, Georgetown, I think all of you have been there one time or another, right? And we are going through, I think, the second cycle of World Heritage listing. So maybe that would be of some interest to the participants. I think when you become a World Heritage Site, the euphoria of having the successful uh, model in your hand, everybody works very hard to make it happen and to be very compliant. But over time, what happens is that um, when you put in a management plan, when you have, we, in Penang, we have a special area plan, which is exactly actually a gazetted plan, uh, which becomes a law, then everybody feels that things are in order. But that's when th you, things start to fall apart, really, because you take your eye off many, many small issues, and you start to leave it to other people to carry out and manage the place when actually it's, very, it's even more important for the whole community to take part in that. So I think the next stage that we are looking at is how do you actually get the community to engage, which is what you have been talking about, and to look at the new paradigms which are now in the global space and which we also have to adopt. So we are actually working quite hard to open up the space and look at the public realm and to look at how um, as a government, maybe agency, we can play a part in really sort of managing what we call uh, sustainable urbanism that's really taking over the world. And every model that you have really has to be revisited almost every five years. And even as you speak about change and you speak about um, the, way that the, the way that people are shifting in the approach to conservation, I think ultimately you really need to get down to very, very strong local levels. And unless government is ready to play a part and to be really inclusive and open about it. The ad advocates will really still have to fight the battles. So like you say, Sohadi, you know, in, in Indonesia, you have many, many historic cities. You mentioned Samarang, which is, um, my family originally came from Samarang, part of my family. But I know what you're talking about, right? The quick fix, the quick results. And in Penang, we also face that position. But we are very fortunate in the sense that we are a very sort of bottom up city. So when things get really bad, we really galvanize the community to come out of their shell and to try and make a difference. So I would encourage um, all, all our conservation advocates in the room to not give up, but to really feel that at some stage you can make a difference. I'll just end there, thanks. Thank you, Lawrence.
very insightful and inspiring comments. And I think uh, many of us here who are playing their role as advocates would be inspired by you, by your comment. And, uh, and in, at, at the chat room, I have uh, one participant, Pak Sujono, would like to ask, uh, maybe Bu Chatrini should address this because this is uh, uh, related to our, our problems in Indonesia, that he thought that he thinks that it is the government in the Indonesian cases, it is the government who uh, is source of the, of the problem in, in, or, or in creating problems or challenges in, in, in conservation effort. And how should we change that? Bukchatrini. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think before we start, I remember that Eileen have to go, uh, I think in oh, yeah. five, five minutes, yeah, maybe. And right. uh, we, we don't have, have a chance to have a picture have, together. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, uh, dear friends, uh, we have uh, Dr. Eileen here and she has to, to leave us because she has other commitment at uh, in five minutes. So I think then the the committee could uh, start taking photographs of, of all of us. And uh, yes, I, I hand it to Widya, please. Yes, okay. So um, uh, if possible, would like to uh, open the video so that we can take a proper- Yes, please. Everybody, put up your face. <laughs> Lawrence, would you please turn on your camera, please? Excellent. <laughs> Okay, then there are two pages, so we'll be taking uh, it twice. So, um, okay, here goes the first one on three, two, one. All right, on, on the second page, three, two, one. All right, okay. Uh, go back to you, Mr. Suhardi. Okay, thank you, Widya. Uh, then, uh, Eileen, uh, since you have to leave, then uh, on behalf of uh, Indonesia Heritage Trust and uh, ICOMOS Indonesia and all participants here, we would like to thank you so much for your time, for your insight and for your knowledge. No, thank you. And I mean, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for an amazing discussion. I've, as I've been taking notes like mad so i've i've come away with a lot from today and, and good luck and uh, with the rest of your celebrations today on, on world heritage day thank, thank you Eileen. all right hopefully we can engage in other occasions bye hey. and bye Eileen. Eileen. yeah then uh, maybe buchatrini should uh, okay. continue yeah so uh so the the questions uh I think it should be answered that uh, we have to educate the people uh, and we have to educate ourselves also as a heritage practitioner. So how to educate the people. So I think this is uh, uh, the big homework for all of us here that uh, as we understand, uh, there are some various things of characters of people and we also experience it uh, uh, that uh, in several areas, uh, we have to uh, uh, facilitate the peoples to understand maybe uh, the things that they already done in their area is already part of the autodidactly, the way to conserve the, the heritage through their tradition, but also uh, how to make an improvement or make it uh, optimal. This is also another thing. So, we also uh, understand if we talk about the government, so which government, if we talk about the local governments, we understand the mayor or the head of the regions will be uh, at least, they keep the role in two times in of the five years. So then after that, it will be changing. And then if we don't have the strong community, so, all the policy can be easily changing. So this is why uh, we from the Indonesian Heritage Trust also usually uh, encourage uh, community in each of area have uh, the community group that is uh, uh, having the, the people that is understand how they have to be acquaintance with their, uh, the way of living in the historic area. So this is, uh, I think what should we do? And for us, 
as a heritage uh, practitioner coming from the universities or uh, people having experiences, I think this is the way we have to share with them. I think that this is the way we have also to keep uh, militantly and also uh, also keep struggling to uh, always have uh, our affability to give the input to the government uh, along our experiences. It takes uh, could not be instantly, but have to be. It's a long process, and we have to be patient. And then uh, I think uh, this is also the way we have to include uh, the youth generation, young people who can uh, carry on uh, the message to the future. Yeah, that's my answer. And Richard, drawing from your vast experiences working in, in, in Asia and Pacific, and especially in many uh, cases, you must come across with uh, these uh, 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 opportunities of dealing with the government sectors. Maybe you could share some lights on this issue? Well, I think that we have actually talked quite a lot about how to uh, engage with different levels of government. But perhaps one thing uh, that I have found to be useful is uh, not to assume that the government is not interested or is in somehow opposition to the uh, shall we say the, the heritage activists within the community. After all, in most cases, the local government is somehow a reflection of the population of the community. And uh, they need to be included in the dialogue. So inclusion is one thing that's very important. And, and one thing that I've certainly always had good experience with whenever I have organized conferences is to have special sec sessions of the conference in which government representatives, mayors of different cities, for example, talk to each other. That's the first thing. The second thing though, is to understand that within local government, there are very few people who have any, even any basic knowledge about what are the needs of the heritage conservation sector. And so the education of, the, of our allies within different sec sections of what is very, shall we say, fragmented silo-based administrations that we are dealing with in Asia, well, and everywhere in the world, uh, that the effort to uh, include and educate these different sectors are is very important. I think one very good example of this is in the, the current program in India called, called Three Day, which is historic uh, city development and civilization yantra, something like that. Huh? Uh, this is actually originates from the Ministry of uh, Public Housing, not from the Ministry of Heritage. Yet it is the main way that uh, government resources and not only just finance and expertise, but also the political will to and the legal resources needed uh, uh, have been brought to bear on you know, the conservation of historic cities throughout India. So uh, engagement with our government partners is very important about this. Uh, so that's all I really wanted to say about that. Uh, and um, perhaps now that I have the floor, maybe I can quickly share with you because I'm gonna to have to leave very soon too. Two, uh, I have two. First of all, two, two screens, if I could. Yes, please. This one is something I have alluded to before, but let me come to it.
this is the competence framework for heritage management, which I uh, said was recently uh, published by UNESCO with uh, ICOMOS. Uh, and it is the guidebook for how we can upskill ourselves as heritage managers to deal more holistically with the uh, sustainable management of heritage resources in a, in a larger framework of community development and good governance. So this is one thing to look at and one thing for you to resource and put in the socket of, of your, your own toolkits. That's one thing I wanted to show you. The second thing I wanted to show you was this is the, the book I've been talking about. No, I don't know. Earlier on, which is going to be here. I will share my screen again for you. Which in this discussion now becomes particularly relevant because we are, let's see here. Uh, because many of the examples in this book have to do with engagement with local government. In fact, I would say most of the examples have to do with engagement with local government, because that is where we make or break this. So here is this book by Walter Jamison and myself, available from Goodfellows publisher, and as I say, you can get, get it online. It is basically dealing with planning issues at the local government level, where we look at heritage as a resource for development in a tourism context. Fantastic, Richard. Thank you so much for, okay, for sharing with us. Say, I think that, that's basically... Thank you. Richard, can we uh, get it online, the books? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Richard, for sharing those two important resources for learning. And then uh, we have last one question that I uh, should be addressed to Ibu Chatrin. I think that uh, we have one participant, Mimi, asking about uh, maybe Ibu Chatrin should uh, reply it in briefly. What are the heritage towns in Indonesia which have uh, practiced uh, the historic urban landscape uh, quite well? Well, it's a, it's a hard question <laughs> because uh, I think it's a, I'm not in the rule uh, to judge which one is the best, but I think uh, we can learn uh, several uh, good points from each of the cities. So maybe uh, we uh, first of it, maybe we can say Sawah uh, Lunto, for instance, how uh, the government have a very good way to uh, have the heritage conservation as a priority there, but maybe the weakness uh, of Sawah Lunto is uh, still having uh, needed for encourage the community. So there, there is still no community group uh, working actively in the Sawah Lunto uh, heritage conservation. And we also have things, uh, maybe Jogja can be uh, one of the uh, example when the community is strong there, but uh, the weakness is coming, frankly to say, more from the government. So this is also the way that we have to combine and then to see uh, the heritage conservation is still uh, uh, a new thing that's still uh, doing by learning by all of us here and also for the government as well. So I think uh, more and more uh, a good example and then uh, the optimal way to achieve the heritage conservation will come to Indonesia. I think that's my answer. Yeah, thank you, Buchatrini. I think all of us agree that uh, to this afternoon we have had we have enjoyed a fruitful, very enriching discussions. Thanks to uh, Richard and Buchatrini and Dr. Eileen. And for information, Richard. Uh, uh, Chatrini mentioned about the World Heritage, uh, recently listed World Heritage site of uh, Ombilin 
coal mining heritage in West Sumatra. And uh, we would like you, hopefully, in uh, in, in near future, uh, we should tap into your your knowledge and your your resources to to assist us in in in, in Sawalunto in helping our colleagues there in uh, in complying to the requirements by the World Heritage Committee in in, in their management plan and and also in other parts of Indonesia that we should we we, engage, we, we hope that we could engage you in in other occasions you you should share your knowledge your fast experiences with us and uh, we hopefully uh, next time you would also answer our invitations for other occasions and for other collaborations richard i'll be happy to uh share whatever knowledge you, whatever little knowledge i have if it's useful i think i'm taking my liberty also i would like to invite also lawrence also some other friends here maybe we can together also to give uh, uh, taking a part in the in the trainings in the future yeah, in fact, Lawrence has has visited Sawalunto. I think when the PPI, when Indonesia Heritage Trust organized our uh, annual gathering, Bucatrini, I think it's back in two thousand eight or two thousand nine, Lawrence and uh, his his lovely wife uh, Linley had uh, visited uh, uh, Sawalunto and Padang as well. And maybe next, uh, Richard should join him as well. I've actually been to Sawalunto several times because I was helping oh, uh, local team. Uh, develop the uh, nomination. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent then, then. All right. And uh, then, uh, I would and unfortunately, dear friends and colleagues, uh, it's only time that limit our, our, our enjoyment today. And uh, after all, I really enjoyed guiding this discussion. We have all learned a lot from our resource persons, from Richard Angelhardt, from Ibu Chatrini and Dr. Eileen. And we have our foreign guests here, uh, Lawrence Law and Luigi Cipolla. And we have all other distinguished friends and colleagues from all over Indonesia. And as your moderator, I thank you so much for your attention and your participation. And with this, I hand it over to Widya Amasara. Thank you, Widya. Okay, thank you, Mr. Soerdi. That was a wonderful session. I think we, we are learning a lot, uh, regardless of our background. Um, and uh, now I would like to uh, invite Titin Fatima from the Board of Expert Indonesian Heritage Trust to deliver the closing remark and and and, and officially close this uh, forum. Ibu Titin, time is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mawidya. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Paswadi, for uh, moderating such a dynamic and fruitful discussion this uh, evening. Uh, I think so many insights uh, and valuable perspective we got from our distinguished speakers today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aileen, uh, Aileen uh, Pak Richard, and Ibu Chatrini also. On behalf of Indonesian Heritage Trust, I would like to say thank you and high appreciation uh, to have you in this World Heritage Day Forum today. And thank you for uh, your valuable sharing and discussions. And uh, for all the participants, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining this event. Uh, we, hope, we hope that we all here can uh, understand and inspire about the shifting paradigm in heritage conservation in Indonesia and also uh, implement this uh, new approach in our uh, respective fields. Uh, I'm sure that today's participants uh, come from various uh, regions with different backgrounds and uh, professions, I think, yeah. Uh, it is not easy task. As we know, uh, we still have uh, big uh, challenges and homeworks uh, for heritage conservation in Indonesia. But uh, keep the spirit on, uh, tetap semangat Bapak Ibu semua, uh, kita bersama-sama berjuang. Uh, well, uh, this is the last event of the series of events held by uh, Indonesian Heritage Trust in celebrating the International Day for Monuments and Science that we usually call it as uh, World Heritage Day or Hari Pusaka Dunia. So uh, now we have uh, reached uh, to the end. Uh, thank you for all your participations. Uh, selamat Hari Pusaka Dunia. Terima kasih banyak.